when will that be land where my possessions lie? We will rest in the fair happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Oh, the transporting rapturous scene that rises to my sight. Sweet fields of radiant living green and rivers of divine. We will rest in the fair happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Filled with the light of my raptured soul, would here no longer stay. In the fair, happy land by and by, just across the sunny evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here today. I know there's some people rolling in because the construction out on the street is causing a couple of detours, but there's a lot of you here already, so great. So once again, welcome, welcome. I appreciate everyone here and I appreciate everyone singing out today, especially our visitors. We know some of you either haven't been here for a while or it's your first time here. We just wanna, on the behalf of the members here, say welcome and it's great to have you here today. So we'll continue singing to the next song, Who Paints the Skies? <laughs> mm. Who paints the skies into glorious day? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who brings his life into mists of flame? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who shakes the valleys and brings the rain? Only the slender of Jesus. Who makes the desert to live again? Only the slender of Jesus. He is wonderful, he is glorious, clothed in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship him, he's the prince of life, he will cleanse our hearts in this river of fire. Who hears the cry of the barren one, only the mercy of Jesus. Who breaks the curse of the heart of stone, only the mercy of Jesus. Who storms the prison and sets men free? Only the mercy of Jesus. Purchasing souls for eternity. Only the mercy of Jesus. He is wonderful. He is glorious. Clothed in righteousness. Full of tenderness. Come and worship him, he's the prince of life, he will cleanse our hearts in his river of God. He is wonderful, he is glorious, clothed in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship him, he's the prince of life, he will cleanse our hearts. In his river of fire.
Next song is There's a Rain. <laughs> As I journey here mid the toil and tears, there's a rainbow, there's a rainbow in the cloud. He will safely leave, I must have no fear. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow that is shining, that is shining. When the storm's all past, comes a brighter day. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow in the cloud. In that city fair, there's a crown to wear. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow that is shining, that is shining. There's a rainbow. We're now going to have our opening prayer. Please stand for that prayer and remain standing for the song that's going to follow. Father, we come to you. We love you. Thank you so much for hearing our songs, <laughs> hearing the offering of our lips and of our hearts, this sacrifice that we offer up to you. We ask God that the sacrifice of our lives is also acceptable to you. Each day, each hour, that we choose to listen to your commandments, to obey your commands, to learn from your wisdom, to reflect your son's light throughout this earth. We praise you, God, because you are awesome. You have loved us so that we would know what love is. You have created us so we would know what wisdom and power is like. You have made this earth, this universe, all things that we can admire and see and marvel at things that we cannot understand, things that modern science even cannot understand. We put our trust and our hope in you, God. We know that your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are far above our thoughts. We cannot hope to understand. And in return, we submit. We bow our heads as Job did to just understand that you are powerful and we are not we ask god that you would please send your blessings on us send your blessings on this church as we strive to do your will as we try strive to obey your commandments give us desire give us boldness in preaching the gospel help us to reach out in love to our friends and our family our acquaintances co-workers classmates Whoever we come in contact with, that we would boldly proclaim your name, we would show them how much you love them and you love us. That this is the reason why we are here to acknowledge you and to proclaim your name as God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit with us, strengthening us, battling back against Satan every temptation and every evil desire that is within us and comes about in this world. We are strong when we rely on your strength. We are weak when we rely on our own. We praise you, God, and we ask for focus today to worship you, 
to pray to you and open up our hearts to study your scriptures and to learn. Every single time that we come here is an opportunity to learn something new, to correct something that was wrong, to gain fuller understanding. We pray that we would do so today. We ask God that you would please bless those who are sick now. Heal them. We know that you are the great healer, whether it is something small or something great, whether it is something we have learned to live with or something that is brand new to us. We pray, God, for your hand of healing. Please bless the doctors that attend to us and give them wisdom in the things that they have skill of. But overall, help us to trust in you, to know that whatever happens, if our life is short or long, that if we rest in your commands and rest in your grace and your mercy, that we will have a home with you. That is what we all want. We know deep down that we want to be with you, even though we may want to be here on earth a while longer. We pray for your blessings in that and guide us as we continue our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where the storm and the rise. Oh, they tell me of a home cloudy day. Oh, the land of the lilies day. Thank you. 
moments. If you haven't got your emblems yet, please raise your hand at this time and we'll get those to you. How do we know when someone loves us? Um, how do husbands and wives know that they love each other? How do friends, how do Christians know that they love each other? A good start is the words, but um, uh, words of love and friendship, but words aren't really enough. We need actions. Uh, a relationship requires time and effort, commitment and sacrifice. And that's the same with God. In the Bible, we see that God does tell us he loves us, but he supports that from beginning to end. Uh, God shows us all of the ways that he's loved us and all of the things that things that he's ever done for us and of course the most important thing that shows his love for us was the gift that he gave of, of his son Jesus Jesus gave himself on the cross died for us and that's really what we remember when we partake of the Lord's Supper every week we remember uh, through the emblems the bread and the cup Remember his body and his blood, his death, his life given for us. So let's let's pray together for the, the bread. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we could be here today. We're thankful for all of the blessings that we have, for the gifts that we have from you, for the great love that you have shown us which is an example to us to show to others. I'm thankful for your son Jesus who gave himself for us and for this bread that we, we take in remembrance of his body that hung on the cross, that, the perfect sacrifice that died for us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together for the cup. Father, we continue our prayer, thanking you for the supper that we have to remember Jesus. This cup that reminds us of his blood, the life that was in his blood was shed for us on the cross. Again, that life that he gave for us, he died so that we might have life in him and live with you eternally. 
pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time we'll be taking up the contribution. And just as a reminder, we have a couple of ways uh, that, that we give. Uh, most of our members probably use the uh, Johnson Avenue app for giving. But for those who have brought a check or money to church and would like to give here, the plate, the offering plate is available back your left, my right of the building as you leave, you can place your offering in there. We were just talking about um, sacrifice, and the money we give is a type of sacrifice. And it reminds me of what a preacher that I knew many years ago used to say. Um, he said that money was stored up life. And what he meant by that is Every dollar that you have, and you, even if you didn't earn it, somebody else earned it. And it was earned by that person taking a part of their life when they could be doing something else and giving that life to his employer and then in turn getting paid for that. So in that sense, money is not just uh, a blessing. It's actually a part of our lives. It, it comes at, at great cost. And when we think of it that way, I think um, our um, contribution has more meaning too. So let's pray together for the offering at this time. Father, we're thankful for all that we have and we're thankful for the opportunity to show our love for you and giving back to you for the work of the church for the spreading of the kingdom, not just in El Cajon and San Diego, but in places throughout the world. And we pray that the money will be used for these types of efforts and more, and that it will be a blessing to those who receive it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand for this song, Freely Freedom. <clears throat> God forgave my sins in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come. To share his love as he told me to. He said, Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. Go in my name because you believe. Others will know. To share his power as he told me to. He said, Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. Go in my name and because you believe.
Well, good morning, everyone. It is certainly a pleasure to see you here this morning, to be here with you. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're glad you're here, because I know our Lord is glad that you're here, as has been expressed in the prayers this morning and in the songs, that we're here for him, to praise him, to thank him for all that we have. Can you just imagine if there were no God? It's unimaginable. How could things even be? But as some would suggest that this is all just accident, if it was, what would you and I be doing here? We wouldn't be here. We'd be somewhere else. But in time, what would we be thinking? How would our thoughts, how would our life, how would our whole thinking be on life? It's like, that's it? People come and go and die and that's it. It just goes on and on and on and on. And the grave is never full. So what is the point in life? The point in life is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has come to give us life. Now, I'm going to do something a little different here this morning. Uh, you know, sometimes I have a long introduction and then a three-minute sermon. Uh, I'm going to give a uh, not quite so long introduction, but in this introduction, I'm going to read about uh, 12 or 15 scenarios. And I want you to know, first of all, Johnson Avenue is not in any of these scenarios. I sure hope not. I wrote this years ago, and I revised it, and in all of these scenarios, they are all just kind of a conglomeration, just kind of a mixture of people that have been in the Lord's body in the past and people that we've known in the world. It is only this last example that I will give that I know these people personally, and I'll let you know uh, when we come to this. All right, there's a young couple. They have an argument. They see things differently. After a while, they recognize the difference between the arguments, and they agree to disagree, and they reconcile. No problem. They mature, they grow, their marriage gets stronger. There's another young couple that uh, have an argument and they refuse to recognize the legitimate difference between the two views and they will not relent their position. Now there's a problem, pride. There's a young child who disobeys their parents. The parents confer with each other, they agree on an appropriate punishment. They're consistent, they're Firm, the child responds, the child repents, changes, obeys, no problem. The family grows, the child matures. Another young child disobeys the parents. The parents can't agree on the punishment. They argue with each other. The child exploits the difference between the mother and the father, continues to disobey, and now there's a problem. The dishonor that the child has for the parent the rebellion, the self-will and the stubbornness on both the parent and the child. Two ladies in a congregation constantly talk about other members. They discover possible problems and needs and they determine to help them. They care for their welfare without any criticism or judgment, no problem. The church grows, congregation gets stronger. Wonderful love. No. Two ladies in another congregation constantly talk about other members. They scrutinize other people's lifestyles. They speculate on their motives. They criticize their possessions, their children, their travel, without ever seeking to discover whether the circumstances or private difficulties that they may be facing. They begin to relish other women's failure or they're jealous of other women's success. Now we've got a problem. There's no love, jealousy, gossip, sowing discord among the brethren. I stop here to quote, it's been attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt more than anyone else, but supposedly Eleanor Roosevelt once said, large minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. <laughs> a brother has been blessed. But now he needs help, uh, and he asks for help. And another brother is glad to take the time and the energy to help restore this brother's welfare. There's no problem. They grow. The congregation sees the brotherly love. They're strengthened in their 
love for each other and the love for the Lord. It's a teaching moment for the congregation. But another brother has been blessed, but now needs help and asks for help likewise. Another brother complains and refuses, saying uh, he didn't have as many blessings as this other brother who's in immediate need, so why should I help him? He's prospering more than I am. Now there's a problem. Selfishness, a self-centered lack of any true brotherly love. The congregation suffers. A local company has to lay off 10 workers. Two of them are Christians. The Christian families are stressed and they're understandably worried. They pray and they share their burden with the church. The congregation rallies around them, offering temporary assistance, job leads, and help to find permanent employment. No problem. It's a growing moment for the church and the congregation. Another local company has a labor dispute, and the workers go on strike. Four of them are Christians. The church helps for a while, as long as it can, then eventually has to stop. The laid off Christians are asking other Christians to demonstrate with them and walk the picket line against the company. Members are not comfortable with this and they refuse. And the elders even consider a rebuke when the laid off workers get angry with the congregation saying that they haven't done enough to support them. The strikers begin to police the picket line and attack any worker who shows up to work. Now there's a huge problem, lawlessness. Rebellion, self-will, ingratitude, prejudice of hatred towards any other who do not agree with them. That's a big one. Yeah, we've got a problem. A couple more. A doctor prescribes a medical treatment that he knows that is safe and sure and good. Refusing expensive surgeries or drugs, no problem. The patient is healed. But there's another doctor who's pressured by the hospital to have expensive surgeries or to prescribe experimental drugs that are very expensive. Now we've got a problem there in the medical world, greed, indifference to man's welfare. And finally, here's a minister who is glad to counsel women in the presence of his wife or another trusted female member. No problem, that's wise. That was one of the first things advised to me in this little office right over here in the corner. But there's another minister who's glad to counsel women in private, exploiting the dynamic of a vulnerable woman seeking help from a man. Now ah, there's a problem. Lust, lying, adulterous hearts, indifference to the weak and invulnerable, and exploiting people for their own personal use. Two men come to my mind right now. You don't know them, it doesn't matter. But I'm sure there are many, many more like that. So, now what's the problem with these? Let me tell you that the problem is not in the White House. The problem is not in Congress. It's not in the state governments. It's not in the state universities. It's not on Wall Street. It's not in the economy. The problem is not taxes. The problem is not corrupt politicians. The problem is not the Middle East terrorism, religious fanatics and zealots. Those, though those are all problematic in their own way, that's not the problem that we're talking about here. The problem, good folks, sweet brethren, is sin. That sounds too simplistic, but it is profoundly true that at the bottom of every of these scenarios and others like them where there is confusion and chaos and hatred and even murder, bore right down to the base of it and it's sin. That's the root cause of all of this. And as we say, sometimes the problem is not knowing what to do, it's doing what we know. The problem is not knowing what sin is. The problem is staying away from sin. That's the problem. Everybody knows what sin is. Even Paul would say the Gentiles who by nature do the things concerned in the law or contained in the law. I believe this is almost intuitive with a little small child. Early on, we all know as parents, and even if we can remember back as little children, early on we know the difference between right and wrong. Why does a little 18 month old have a guilty look? You walk in the room, okay, what have you done? 
They know the difference between right and wrong. The problem is not knowing the difference. The problem is, will I stay away from that sin? And I'm going to share three or four verses this morning with you, and this will be our sermon. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul is talking about the man and woman, how the woman is subject to the man. And he makes this statement that does not sit well with our culture today. When he said that Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, a knee-jerk reaction to that passage is that, oh, so you're saying women are stupid, huh? That they're <laughs> ignorant. No, that's not what that passage is saying. The passage is not saying that Eve was ignorant. It is saying that Eve was weakened in the state that she was in because she was away from God. And she was with the devil. What do you mean by that, Kenny? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read just two or three verses. You know them. We can quote them. But I want it to be in front of you, on your lap, reading it in front of you. In the third chapter of Genesis, when the devil appears in the garden to Eve, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> the devil appeared, he said, shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? And in verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I want you to notice a few things about this. First of all, Eve was not ignorant of the law. As a matter of fact, she quotes it perfectly to the devil. She knows exactly what the law is. And with all of the other trees that are in the garden, there was no need to eat that. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not playing fast and loose with the scriptures. I, I, I want you to know that. I, this is not my intent. I'm just putting out a suppose so. Let's suppose for a moment that it's been quite a while that Adam and Eve have been in the garden. Now we read the Genesis account and it sounds like one thing happened right after another immediately, instantaneously. Well, that, that's not necessarily true. When Adam and Eve were put in the garden and they were told about the trees, the trees you can eat all these, you just can't eat this one, it's in the middle of the garden. With all of the other trees that were there that were good to eat, it could have been some time before they ever got to there. As a matter of fact, what I believe is strongly implied in this narrative is that Eve never would have considered this if the devil had left her alone. It's the devil who comes and starts arguing with her. She's not ignorant of the facts. She knows the law. She knows the rules. She's quoted it to him. But what the devil is doing is catching her alone. Adam's not there. God's not there. And what he does is he starts his argument. Oh, you won't die. Some have even suggested, I don't know if this is true or not, that the devil might have even partaken of the fruit of the front of her to demonstrate, see, I didn't die. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, so don't, don't quote me. <laughs> But he certainly with his words are implying to Eve, you will not die. And you've heard us say that. That's the devil's way of saying God is a liar. You cannot trust him. Look at this fruit. It's beautiful. It's good. It's good for food. And furthermore, as he begins to pile argument upon argument against God's law, he says, if you eat it, you'll get smart. Now that should be offensive. You know, oh, she's there. well, she knows the law. You'll be wise, but he takes it to the next level. You'll be as smart as God. It will make you wise. You'll be like God. Now he has given the ultimate argument to Eve, where Eve now is looking at this and saying, oh, well, you know, we can't uh, eat because God said, if we eat, we'll die. He said, no, you won't die. You won't, oh, really? No, you won't die. Matter of fact, it's good for food. Well, yeah, it look, yeah. Have it taste, all these others taste really good. Maybe, maybe this one tastes good. And the devil said, not only that, you eat that and you'll become like one of the gods. You'll be a god. And so now, hey, hey, you can just see the, the doubt building in her mind. Really? Oh, hey, well, that's not bad. We could be like one of the gods. Maybe he's hiding this. Uh, maybe he's worried that we'll eat of that fruit and we'll be just like him and he wants a monopoly on this God syndrome. Okay, I can see how this is happening. 
she is following along. Now, if Adam were there or God were there, they might have reminded Eve of God's law. That's what she needed. She needed to be reminded, even though she just quoted it. She is being bombarded with all of the arguments of the devil, which we see in the world around us every day. The arguments of why it's okay to do this and this and that. Even though God says no, the world says, oh yes, no problem. That's not a problem. The great mistake for Eve was allowing herself to start thinking about disobeying God. Because that's where it starts. It starts with thinking. At first, it was unthinkable in verse 2. But now you get down in verse 4, yeah, it's thinkable. We can do that. That's just what Achan did. You remember in Joshua when he saw the spoil of the Babylonians of Ai? Man, that looks good. And that's why he took it. He started thinking about, and he later would say, I coveted those things. And we know the sin of Achan. David, the king, he started thinking about Bathsheba as he was watching her bathing. That's what happens. Judas, why did Judas betray our Lord? He started thinking that, ah, uh, he just realized that, hey, we can give you some money if you'll do this. That's how the devil works on us, and that's why the problem is sin, because at the root of it, the idea is to take us away from God's law, away from God's word, and start thinking along the rationale and the reason and the logic of the world, because the world makes it so reasonable, so logical. And there's where Eve is right here. She is being drawn away from God. And now that takes me to the next passage, James 1.14, when James says, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then what James 1.15 says, then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. That's the formula. Mark that down, James 1.14.15. That's how sin happens. We may start out knowing, we may start out quoting God's law. We know it top to bottom from Sunday school. We know it all, yes. The problem is never knowing what sin is. The problem is, will we allow the world to pull us away from that? And you know, I, I know this sounds noble. And we've all seen, heard, or maybe even said this. But when we are facing a dilemma or a moral conflict that, oh, I don't know, is this right or this? Uh, you know, I just need to get away for a little while. Just get away and, and, and sort this out. Well, that, that sounds good on the surface. If we're going to get away to sort this out, if that means I'm going to take my Bible with me and I'm going to read what God says and I'm going to pray about this, great. That's what we should do. That's how we should, quote, get away from the world. But if by getting away we think, what we're going to do here is we're just going to go out here and just start thinking about what the world says. And we're going to talk to these people and talk to those people. And then we're going to think, yeah, yeah, give me some arguments. Tell me why it's okay to do such and such or okay to do that and such. And when we start listening and start hearing and start entertaining the logic, the idea, the wisdom of the world, we're sitting ducks. We are right in the sights of the devil and he'll pull the trigger and we'll be just like Eve, who thought it would be okay. But in fact, what we have done is that we have violated the very sin that we know is wrong. We need someone to lead us back to the Lord. Last week, we talked about the fact that people look in the mirror and they're not happy with what they are. Yeah. Not happy. You you know, I, I told you, I'm not happy for years. I, for those of you who weren't here last Sunday, I'll go ahead and say it again. <laughs> uh, I don't like who I am. Uh, wait a minute. No, I don't like what I am. No? I always wanted to be a 6'5 Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I'm not. I will never will be. Because what we are, male, female, tall, thin, short, fat, red, yellow, black, or white, 
What we are is by chance. But who we are is by choice. Who are you? I'm done. Song later, get ready. <laughs> I hope you are a child of God. I hope you are a person not that will never be confronted with sin because that's an impossibility. But when we are confronted with sin, that we recognize that the problem is sin and the problem will come when the devil will try to pull us away from God. That is why it is repeated over and over through our life, our parents' life, our grandparents' life. If the Word of God is with you, that will lead you to life. But you put the Word of God aside and you start following the wisdom of the world, you're going to go exactly down the path that Eve did. The devil just can't wait to have us sit down with you, talk with you, convince you that there's another way. That other way is sin. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You want to go to God? It's going to be through His Word, through His Son. Period. No other way. You set that aside, the devil will come in and say, I'll show you another way. Really? Yeah. yeah. Right. What we are is by chance. Who we are is by choice. You can become a child of God this morning, right now. If you'll come while we stand. Close it. In that field, I would wield sickles, brave and true. In the fight for the right, I would dare and do. Spend my days in my grace. All the journey through, let me live close to thee each day. Let me let me live close to close to thee. Guide me, guide me on the long road away. Let me let me live close to close to thee. Let me walk in love with walk through close to thee. And a very warm welcome to each and every one that is here this morning. For those of you that are visiting with us, we are thankful so much that you've come our way and joined us to worship God on this first day of the week. If you are visiting and you would like us to have a record of your visit or you have a request, there's a, a visitor's form in the front of you on the back of the seat. If you just grab that and fill that out. And uh, you can hand it to anyone or leave it in your seat. We appreciate it so much. <coughs> a little bit of family news before we leave this morning. We have a couple of members who are experiencing some health issues currently. Please remember Carol Crawford in your prayers. Carol's an elderly member who has been unable to attend worship for several years now. And she fell a couple weeks ago. And after spending time in the hospital, it was now continuing her recovery at Victoria Post Acute Care. And uh, Carol, if you've talked to her, she's very sociable. And uh, she loves uh, visits and calls or cards. And uh, her contact information is in the morning messenger this morning. You can retrieve it from there. Also, please remember uh, our sister Angie Shire. 
she's at home and she's still recovering from surgery uh, that she had a pacemaker implanted this last week. She's doing well, but uh, she's still experiencing some issues due to low blood pressure. So please continue to remember Angie and your prayers as well. And we have a couple new requests this morning. I want to make sure that we are aware of them. The Barifaldis are requesting prayers for their grandson, Luca. <clears throat> he has pneumonia and a rapid heart rate. Luca is a young lad, and he has some great difficulties from birth to today. And he has great needs from the family. So please pray for Lucas healing, pray for his parents, and please pray for Joe and Carol, who are very instrumental in helping uh, Luca and his parents. <clears throat> also another request, our friend Hannah, who's been visiting here for a while, is reaching out to see if anyone has a room to rent and or some line of work like caretaking, housework, etc. She can pay each month, but can also cover costs by providing cleaning or caretaking. If anyone knows of someone who could help benefit from a mutual arrangement such as this, please let uh, Jeff or Stephanie Borden know. And then yesterday, we had heard that uh, a former member here, Ron Clinkenbeard, that uh, he's also Melinda DeCherry's grandfather, he passed away yesterday morning, and uh, he had been in and out of the hospital recently, but uh, at this time, I, I don't have any other details, so we we'll just share our love and compassion with uh, the family, and uh, make sure you let Melinda and, and her family know. So, BBS, it is one month away, four weeks away, and... Um, would like for you to please take a couple minutes to check the board in the back for opportunities to volunteer. Uh, there's uh, items that are needed and um, we need to uh, see what we can do to help fulfill a, a full and fun week dedicated to the kids. And it's coming up on July 10th through the 14th. We need crew leaders and assistant crew leaders and I think right now that list, sign up list is no one on it. So, <laughs> we need help. If you have any questions, uh, you can see uh, Natasha Revelo and Mario, and uh, I'll help you direct you to that sign up list. Also, uh, please remember the June assignments are in the uh, entryway there. You can get a copy. If you're not going to be here, you know, please contact Bill Go or Bob Coyle and let them know ahead of time if you would, please. So this morning, before we're dismissed, we will be taking a few minutes, as we do each year, to recognize our current high school graduates. And our Spanish brethren should be joining us any second now. They will be joining us. Or mañana. <laughs> or mañana. <laughs> so um, if you would just please remain seated and um, Make room, if you can, for our Spanish brethren as they come downstairs to join us. One last note uh, also. Um, after that, at the end of services, there's a trustee meeting. And if the trustees can just go right to the back to the elder's office, we will have our meeting and uh, get that done and out of the way for this quarter. So um, thank you, uh, Barry. Give them a couple more seconds. But, um, Evelyn and I had the privilege uh, Friday of uh, seeing Carol Crawford, and you never know what you're going to walk in on. Somebody that's been shut in, and and she's in a rehab facility right now. And uh, we walked around the corner, and she was sitting in her wheelchair, just crying, just absolutely crying. And we, it, I mean, we didn't know what was going on. Nobody else in the room. Didn't know what was going on. And she's got a roommate. There's two people in the room that is uh, rather coarse in many, many ways. 
and uh, the lady was out of the room at the moment, and Carol was just relieved that she was out of the room, but so depressed that she was coming back. Oh. And you just, like I said, you just never know what you're going to walk in. And uh, so we were able to visit with her a little bit, and uh, she was uh, much more cheerful when we left than when we showed up. Uh, but uh, I encourage you to go do those kind of things. Uh, a lot of times it's better for you than it is for them. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very rewarding. Okay, they're either coming or they're not. <laughs> uh, Keith and John, you want to come up here? Here they come. That's the first way it work. <laughs> we appreciate you all joining us uh, today to recognize our graduates. This is one of several important milestones in their lives and in their families' lives as they embark on their journey into adulthood. Uh, I'm sure most of you remember when you were at this point of life. Uh, for some of us, it was a little longer ago than others. <laughs> in the brochure that you received, the graduates have written a short letter to the Johnson Avenue family expressing their gratitude for the teaching and the love that they've received uh, from you and the positive impacts you've had on their lives. Their parents have also shared a few thoughts about how our church family has helped their child grow and the, the fine young women they are today. We hope you take a few minutes to read their letters and of course continue to encourage them uh, they, as they grow. Uh, they, they will remind us all how important coming together is and being a family is to our children as they grow and mature. Your love, your friendship, and your example help shape their minds and hearts to what it means to be part of the family of God. I'm going to introduce them and ask them to come up front, and we won't make them stand up here uh, uh, for very long. Uh, we're going to present them with a monogram Bible, and I'll read you the inscription. It says, uh, presented to the graduate and the date from the Johnson Avenue Church family. God has blessed you with intelligence and talent, and our prayer is you will use them well in his service for the rest of your life, and that God will be your guide, the elders. And then 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our, our first graduate this year uh, could not be here today, and that's Abigail Seiler. Um, Abby graduated from Heritage Christian School, and she's going to take a gap year while their uh, family relocates to the East Coast, and then she'll decide on her future plans from there. And our second graduate, uh, of course, I have a rather special attachment with, uh, Willow Swain will graduate from Grossmont High School this week with honors, and she has decided, uh, she's deciding on where she will continue her education with an emphasis on psychology, Willow. Yes. <laughs> so here's a few reminders we'd like uh, to share with you as you go on in your, in your journey. First and foremost, remember that God cares for you. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, lest anyone should boast, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. God graciously saved you, and I know you've dedicated your life to his service. You're a Christian, a disciple of Christ. It's been a privilege to see you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Meet your challenges with confidence. Seek wise counsel from godly friends and your parents, but only after you first ask God for wisdom and direction. 
Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 remind us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And that little book we gave you, don't neglect that Bible. I know you probably use it on your phone, but you know, well, that one looks good too. Uh, for it is the word of God that makes you wise unto salvation and it is the sacred scriptures that will sanctify your very soul. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 reminds us. As we close, the elders along with the entire congregation would like to send you off with this charge. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 37, three through four. Live out the commission God has given you and you will shine as a light in a dark world, always ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. We extend you a great hearty congratulations and best wishes for your future. And now you can all fly. But this time, John's going to lead us in a prayer for the graduates, and then after that, it will be led in our closing prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now asking you to surround Willow and Abby with grace and bless them with hopes that, that they will move into the future with an eager and open heart. Help them to put the knowledge, skills, and insights gained through their education to further your kingdom, Father. Inspire them to believe in the goodness of life even when faced with challenges and difficulties. We know that all good things come through you, Father, and we hope that you continue to light theirs and our way to you, please. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. To be standing now, we'll be led in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship with you and celebrate what you and your son have done for us. As services end, let us dwell on your word, God. Let us remember your son, Jesus, for without him, we'd have no hope of making it into heaven. Please guide us as we depart and as we go about our week. We know this world can be very tough at times, and we ask that you walk by our side every step of the way and teach us to find solace in you, God. God, we pray for the graduates as they're about to head off to college or wherever they decide to go. Keep your hand on their shoulder. Keep their eyes to you, God. We offer up this prayer to you in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. What are you guys doing today? Oh, well. He's a...